CASBs, or Cloud Access Security Brokers, are all the rage right now. Everyone's talking about how to secure their cloud environment. But do you need a CASB? Well, the only way you know whether or not you need a CASB is to evaluate your various use cases. And so we're going to walk through the top six or so use cases for CASBs. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy. I'm a Vice President at ARG, and while I work for ARG, this video is my own and not necessarily a reflection of the views or opinions of my employer. This channel is all about helping IT leaders make great business decisions. And making a decision around a CASB can be very challenging. You see, the functions of a CASB aren't extraordinary. They're not unique, I should say. They are extraordinary for what they do. But when you review the list of CASB functions, you might have a lot of tools within your current cybersecurity posture that deliver those functions. But they don't deliver them in a cloud access environment or enable you to control the environments within distinct cloud frameworks. But your use cases will determine whether or not a CASB will fit your organization. So let's take a look at some high level use cases. Now, our first use case is personal device security and control. When our employees are using their personal devices, and this is a fundamental concept of SASE, Secure Access Service Edge, where Gartner defines SASE as the ability of users to use any device from any location on any network to access their workloads. Being able to allow our employees to use their personal devices, our contractors or um, vendors to access cloud environments, which we may control, has a lot of benefits, but there's also a limitation. So because we are not managing that device, it's not a corporate device, we cannot put an agent on that device generally. So CASBs resolve that problem by, uh, by implementing a reverse proxy, which, which when the user attempts to log into the cloud environment, that user will be redirected to the CASB and the CASB will then make the connection to the cloud environment. A lack of visibility into the device status allows us to avoid any sort of privacy issues where we're not monitoring any traffic on that outside of the specific traffic flow going into our specific cloud application. And by doing so, that allows that particular workload to be conducted without interfering with anything else on the user's machine. Now, CASBs can adjust the authorization. They can understand um, the context of that machine and determine whether or not they should allow broad access or maybe narrow access, depending upon the configurations that the organization sets within the CASB. It creates a secure work environment by preventing data leakage. It doesn't allow um, users, for example, uh, based upon the settings that you provide, but you can restrict users, for example, uh, for downloading sensitive information or corporate information onto their personal device, where maybe they can download information onto their corporate device. The CASB will also scan for malware. Since we don't know the security posture of the particular device, the CASB will interrogate the flows between the cloud and the device and ensure that no malware is being uploaded. The next use case for CASB is data protection. Now, CASBs are designed to protect data as their fundamental purpose. They understand the context of the data, so CASBs are smart enough, based upon your training, of course, of the CASB, but they're smart enough to recognize uh, personal identifying information, PII, or maybe PCI inf information, healthcare information, and so forth. It can assign a higher protection level to those sensitive data points, and it can also do some things in terms of data manipulation. The uh, one that's probably used most frequently is the pseudonym, pseudonymization, say that three times fast, of data. And what is pseudonymization? That's when you replace identifying data, let's say a birth date, with generic data. Maybe you just use the birth year, um, rather, so that piece of information is no longer identifying, but it is um, still meaningful. And meaningful in the way that you can still run analytics against a birth year, just as you can a birth date. CASBs can also limit access to data. It will limit whether or not data can be viewed, edited, deleted, or downloaded based upon the context and the permissions assigned to that particular user. With API integration, you can actually encrypt data. Now, most CASBs will still allow you to run analytics and do searches on that data, even when it's encrypted. So you're not losing access and, and functionality when that, when that data has been encrypted. 
And with an agent, information can be scanned in transit. So if someone is simply sending an email, that email, even though it's not going into a particular cloud environment, can be uh, interrogated, can be searched, and key information can be identified. Let's say uh, key product information, for example, or personal identifying information. If it was contained in that email, it can be tracked. Now, if, you're, if your users are sending files to uh, people both internal and external to the organization. Many CASBs have a form of digital rights management, which might force the recipient of that data to take some extra steps before they can open and view that data, like establish an authentication. Our next use case is account takeover. Now, most organizations have at least 10, and some organizations have upwards of a thousand individual cloud environments that they're managing and monitoring. So the risk of a individual account within any one of those cloud environments being taken over is real, and CASBs can help with that. CASBs use user behavioral analytics through their detailed logging to ensure that users are operating consistently, consistent with the norms that have been established previously over time. It'll challenge abnormal behavior with additional authentication, for example, or establish um, automatic limits, such as preventing excess file downloads or preventing a user from accessing information that they normally don't access, even though they might have permission. If they see someone browsing a directory, which they do have permission to view, but they don't view frequently, if they see excessive browsing in that directory, they could limit or force that user into some other uh, context before allowing that session to continue. I mentioned data encryption previously, but there's an individual use case around data encryption that's really important. If your CASB has an API interface into a cloud application, you can frequently provide encryption of your data within that cloud environment. Now, this allows you to independently encrypt rather than using the, clouds, uh, the cloud service providers encryption tools. You can independently encrypt your data, preventing the cloud service provider from ever viewing your information. And it also prevents them from accessing that information and maybe delivering it to a third party, let's say under a subpoena or warrant of, of some, uh, some sort. Now, why would a cloud service provider look at your data and possibly give it to another uh, organization? Don't know, but it, it happens and you can protect yourself by encrypting your data both at rest and in transit with a, uh, cl with a cloud access security broker encryption algorithm. One of the early uses of CASB was to identify shadow IT or unsanctioned applications from being used by employees. Now, CASBs will identify users that are uh, utilizing these unauthorized cloud applications, but you'll have to determine what to do with those events when they do transpire. Most CASBs will provide you a risk score for the applications that your users may be accessing, and that will inform your decision as to how to deal with the individual applications. You can, of course, pro provide coaching and counseling if it's an issue. Some organizations allow basic access to cloud applications, let's say Facebook, as long as users are simply reading and posting innocuous content. But the CASB can monitor the post, and this is not necessarily snooping, but what the CASB will do is it will look for keywords or key identifying information that, uh, that might reveal a risk to the organization, and it'll establish an audit trail of those interactions that will allow you to come back and establish a case in the future if necessary. Our last use case is compliance. Compliance is a great use case for CASB. In fact, most people use CASB for their compliance operations. Most CASBs pr provide templates that'll help you comply or set up compliance policy for things like GDPR or the California Consumer Privacy Act and other um, widely recognized uh, compliance frameworks. CASBs record access to data and they also identify records that might exist across clouds. So when someone exercises their right to be forgotten, for example, a CASB can help you identify where that user has records so they can be properly deleted. I also mentioned the ability for CASBs to pseudonymize. 
information. That's replacing identifying information with more innocuous or more generic information, like a birth date with just a birth year. They can also anonymize information, which is completely deleting information that might be identifiable or tokenize information. And now tokenize information is replacing information with non with substitute non-identifiable information. Um, but it's different than encryption. So encryption has a mathematical alg algorithm. Tokenize is more of a random replacement with individual pieces of information, all of which help you maintain privacy of your users' records when they're out in a cloud environment. So what are some key takeaways here? Well, CASB for most business organizations, except for the very large organizations, CASB is still a relatively new concept. But since all of the workloads, or 80% of the workloads according to Gartner, have been moved out to the cloud, it's something that organizations really have to consider moving forward. The CASB decision has to be use case driven. There are at least 20 different CASB offerings that I can think of immediately. Not all operate the same. They're not have, they really haven't been commoditized yet. So you really have to understand your use case and work with the CASB providers that you're considering to have them de uh, demonstrate how your use cases are satisfied by their particular solution. Be sure that you get both a forward proxy and a reverse proxy CASB. Not all of your users will be accessing the cloud environments from corporately owned computers where you can put an agent that would facilitate a forward proxy. Reverse proxies allow your users to use pretty much any machine that they want to use while maintaining a high degree of security and control. And also look for CASBs with APIs into your key cloud environments. This will create a huge opportunity for you to gain additional control over your data. I hope this video was helpful. If you're considering a CASB and want to reach out for some further conversation, I'm happy to do that. My contact information is in the description of this video. Feel free to reach out for a conversation. And if you got some value out of this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, a like, and thank you very much in advance for doing that. That helps other people see this video. And if you want to come back to my channel for similar content in the future, feel free to just hit that subscribe button. That will simply put my videos in your feeds so you can find your way back here at your convenience. Thanks very much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.